hope. And so that's what I want to talk about today. <clears throat> what does the word hope mean? Well, there is an expectation. Something you believe will happen. These are all things that you hope for. Something to have confidence in. The Christian's hope has to do with the future, the coming of Jesus, the resurrection of us, and the new earth is something that we all hope for. If we're not well, we hope that we'll be better very soon. Doesn't always happen that way, but we all have hopes. We, we think of the end of sickness, the end of pain, the end of sin, and the living in a glorious place. We have a hope and a certainty that Jesus' death and sacrifice on the cross, if we accept it, is sufficient for us. We have a hope because of Christ's resurrection that we too will be resurrected to live in this earth made new. We all have hopes. Children have hopes. Children have a hope that they will get a birthday present, that they will get a Christmas present. And I remember in South Africa, I don't know if it's still the same now, but if a child had lost its tooth, where we had the tooth fairy, they had the, the, tooth, the, the mouse that would come and bring them money. Now, as I say, I don't know if that's still the same thing, but... There is that hope. And I think, too, that animals and birds have a hope as well. <clears throat> they have an expectancy, the animals have an expectancy, if it's your pet, that you will feed it on time. I know that when I have been here for board meetings and elders' meetings, my cat is always outside waiting for me to come home. And sometimes I think, oh, you're going to get run over, you silly thing. But no, he just moves in time and he knows that I've been out and that I'm there to shut him in the house and to feed him. <clears throat> Some people might call it a conditional reflex. But I think that something is built in an animal's mind. We have a paradise duck that lives on the paddock just, just below our house. Now, it had a mate for many, many years, and the mate got killed on the road about 18 months ago. And she was a very, very lonely duck. Now she has another mate, but this mate is an odd one because he doesn't stay with her the whole time. He comes, and there's a great noise of squawking and fluttering and flying around together, and then after a couple of days, he's off again. And she's just lonely, left there. And she might just stay there just for two or three days and then he turns up again. I think he's two-faced. I think he's got another wife somewhere, actually. Yeah. But, you know, the, the paradise duck, they mate for life. So there's something not quite right in this family of ducks. Early in the book, Desire of Ages the chapter on God's chosen people, it says that the Jewish people awaited the Saviour's coming. Upon this event, they had rested their brightest hopes in song and in prophecy, in the temple worship and in household prayers, they had enshrined his name. And yet at his coming, they didn't know him. He came to his own and his own received him not. The Saviour's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve heard the promise that the Saviour was going to redeem them, they thought that their firstborn son was going to be the solution to their problems. And who was their firstborn son? It was Cain, wasn't it? And the things that happened in Cain, well, it was a very sad situation. In fact, Adam and Eve lost their two sons, didn't they? One, because Cain killed his brother, and the other, Cain, he was, had to leave that home and go out in desert places. 
and their hopes were completely dashed when he killed his brother um, Abel. All through the ages, the prophets have spoken of the Saviour's coming to redeem them. Prophets were slain because of their beliefs. But Jesus was born just at the right time. God had the master plan in hand. The shepherds watching their sheep on the hills outside Bethlehem, in their quieter moments, they used to pray and they used to talk about the coming saviour. You see how a strong history had gone through all the ages and that they were expecting the saviour. Well, when in this quiet time, they looked and there was this bright brightness of the angels. They probably didn't realise it was angels at the time. But there was that light and there was that singing. And they actually were terrified. But then an angel came to them and said, Don't be afraid, for this day I'm bringing you good tidings of great joy and that the Saviour has been born. Well, the shepherds didn't quite know where to go, but they were shown where to go. They left their sheep, which was something that they probably normally would never do, and they went to find the baby born in the manger. <clears throat> they had their hopes realised, didn't they, when they found the baby? Although they probably weren't sure that it was going to be a, a baby small as it was, they probably weren't sure just how it was going to happen. What about Mary and Joseph arriving in Bethlehem to be taxed? Mary very likely was feeling very, very uncomfortable. She was suffering labour pains at the time when they came into the city, into the town, and she would have been very, very uncomfortable. She'd probably been on a donkey for many hours and she was longing and hoping for a soft bed where she could lie down and stretch her body and have her baby in a quiet and peaceful and comfortable place. Well, she, she had a very special, um, precious burden on board. But in the city of the royal line of Joseph, Mary and Joseph are unrecognised and unhonoured. Weary and homeless, they traverse the entire street in the middle of the city and they went from the gate of the narrow street, from the gate of the city to the eastern extremity of the town, vainly, vainly seeking a resting place for the night. There is no room at the crowded inn in a rude building where the animals are housed and sheltered, they at last find a place of refuge. The saviour of the world was born. The shepherds on the hills see and hear the angels singing, and I told you they were terrified. But the angel comes to tell them where to go and to bring the good news to them. Their hopes were realised. And as the angelic host disappeared and the light faded, the shepherds left their sheep and found the rough shelter. A more humble and smelly place probably couldn't be found. And yet the creator of the universe, the Son of God, made his entrance into the world there. He had left his, the majesty of heaven. When you think of the tremendous contrast between the majesty of heaven, the wonderful place that he had come from, and to be born in a rude dwelling is actually quite mind-boggling. Now, Simeon was an old man, and he was a just and devout man, but it had been revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. His hopes were realised when 40 days after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary took him to the synagogue in Jerusalem to give an offering and to dedicate him to the Lord. Through the Holy Spirit, Simeon understood that this is the one who has waited, he has waited to see. Also there present that day, there was Anna who, who was a prophetess. She had her hopes realised when she saw that Simeon had the baby in his arms. And she pours out her heartfelt thanks that she had been permitted to behold the child. 
Then the, the, the wise men who had studied the prophecies, they were Gentiles. And so when they arrived in Jerusalem, I mean, they saw the star and they, they, were, they knew that a baby was to be born. And they, they followed that star and it came into Jerusalem. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were really disappointed and amazed that nobody was there to talk about this new baby, this new king. <clears throat> Herod the king, who was a very evil man, pretended he wanted to worship this new king. But his hopes were dashed because the wise men were told by God to go home through a different route. You know the story. Joseph also was told in a dream that he was to take the child and his mother to Egypt. Desire of Ages, page 65, tells us that Herod ordered all the male children under the age of two years to be killed. This dreadful act of cruelty was one of the last that Herod ordered. Soon after, he died a fearful death. What were Jesus' hopes as a young boy growing up? Well, the first time he went to the Passover service at the age of 12, he learned a lot of things. And his parents lost him for a period of time. But when he was found in a side room at the temple, his parents were upset and they said to him, don't, but he said to them, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? There was a growing awareness with Jesus as a young boy that he had a special mission to do. As a dutiful son living in a peasant's home, he hoped to lighten the burden of his parents. He often den denied himself to give food to some who were hungry. And it was his utmost hope to bring comfort and sympathy to those who were burdened. At his baptism, he worked with, after his baptism, he worked with his disciples, teaching them, trying to instill in them and the multitudes a new outlook, a new kingdom, and a different concept to what the Pharisees taught. There are so many stories in the Gospels of people who experienced a belief and hope in him. Think of Mary Magdalene when she was brought before Jesus in the temple courts. They made her stand before the group. The scribes and the Pharisees confronted Jesus. You know that this woman should be stoned. Now what say you? She is standing there with her head covered, no doubt, and her eyes downcast. And she's waiting for the first stone to fall. Did she have hope? No, I don't think she had hope at that moment. But Jesus knew the very best way to handle the situation and how she was ever thankful and hopeful and rejoiced ever after. But she was told not to sin anymore. What about the people that Jesus healed? What about the people who were raised from the dead? What about the relatives of the healed people and the, the dead people who were given life again? How could you ever forget such an experience? Would you not have faith and hope in the one who gave you that blessing? The disciples had a mindset that Jesus would assert his power to set up a political party and that they would be his ministers. After all, he could provide all the food that they needed when there was a shortage. He could heal all the people who had sicknesses. He could bring peace. He could get rid of the Roman influence and to change the Pharisees' attitude. They found it so hard when Christ allowed himself to be taken through the courts and eventually be murdered by the satanic men. The disciples' hopes were completely dashed. They all forsook him and fled. Their confidence was completely shattered. Their beloved leader was gone and they were so alone. They might have thought, well, where do we go from here? Or they may have been too distraught to think of the future. 
Where were they on the Friday night? The Sabbath. Saturday night, we know that they met together in the upper room. The doors closed and barred because they were fearing that the same outcome for, for Jesus may be the same as what they were going to experience. This Sunday morning was a, was a day of confusion, uncertainty and perplexity. By now, there were reports that Christ had risen, had been resurrected. Peter had been bowed down with remorse as well. And they said, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Late on the Sunday afternoon, two of the disciples were on their way to Emmaus. I know that you know this story, but it bears repeating. They had eight miles to travel to their place in Emmaus from Jerusalem. These two were not prominent, uh, did not hold a prominent part in Christ's work. However, they were earnest believers in him. They had celebrated the Passover in Jerusalem and were very concerned by the events of the last few days. They had heard the news of the removal of Christ's body from the tomb and the report of the women. They were so disheartened, feeling they had feelings of hopelessness. They were walking in the shadow of the cross. Now, not far on in their journey, a stranger joined them. And so they were so downcast that they didn't really look at him properly and they did not recognise who he was. And the stranger was observing them that they were so sad. And he said to them, Tell me, why are you so sad? They replied, Are you a stranger in Jerusalem and you don't know the things that have come to pass? They told, of his dis they told him of their disappointment. <coughs> we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. But he was delivered up to be condemned to death and they crucified him. Well, beginning at Moses, Christ explained to them the things concerning himself. They had looked upon his death as the destruction of all their hopes. Now he teaches them why Christ had to die. <coughs> Excuse me. Now they are nearing their home and Jesus makes as if he's going to carry on. Excuse me. It's evening time <coughs> and the workers have all finished working in the fields and they've gone home. And Jesus is about to go on his way and they implore him and plead with him. No, you must come and abide with us because it is far late into the evening. And you need food and you need rest and we want you to come in. Well, Jesus came in and you know the story. While they prepared the food, he was perhaps resting. Didn't take them long to get the simple meal ready. And they're sitting there. And they asked their guest, please, will you bless this food? And it's at this particular time that they realised who their guest was because he had lifted his hands and they saw, what did they see? The nail prints, didn't they? And they knew that it, that it was with Jesus. Of course, the minute that they realised who it was, Jesus vanished from their sight. And then they just completely forgot about the meal and forgot about how tired they were and they prepared themselves to go back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples what had happened. And of course, the stranger was there, but they didn't see him. He went with them. And it's evening and it's dark. And how do you go over mountain paths and difficult places when it's dark? And you really can't see very well. I don't know that they would have, they certainly wouldn't have had a torch as we know it. But the stranger there, Jesus is there helping them over the rough places. And there are times when they fell, but they carried on. <clears throat> and they said, when Jesus disappeared from their view, they had said, did not our hearts burn within us while he, t while he talked with us by the way? 
They were so excited. One time they're just so downcast and so have a feeling of hopelessness. Then when Jesus came to be with them, that feeling completely changed and it was a new, well, virtually a new experience for them. So much so that they just wanted to get and see the other disciples. <clears throat> What made the difference? The difference was that the presence of Jesus was with them. And they also had a better understanding of what his work was to be. <clears throat> when they arrived at the place, they knew that the disciples were going to be upstairs in the upper room. And when they got there, they found that the door was barred. And I suppose they were very, inside they were very, very quiet because they wouldn't want people to know that that's where they were because they were terrified that the soldiers were going to come to get them. <clears throat> well, eventually the door is open, but not until they say what their names are. And so when they get inside, they find that the, the other disciples are really still very terrified and having a great perplexity because they just didn't understand the things that had gone on. They knew that Jesus was not in the, in the tomb and they'd heard the reports of the women as well. <coughs> but when Jesus appeared unto them in the supper room, Everything changed. And they went forward, the disciples went forward with, with a new fervour to do Christ's will. <coughs> Satan too has hopes. He was never weary in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth. Jesus' life was one, of lo one long struggle against the prince of darkness. Nazareth was well known for its wicked inhabitants, yet Jesus never stooped to sin. Satan had hopes as well of overcoming Jesus when he led him into the wilderness. His greatest hope was that Jesus would not go through the horror of the cross, would not, and that that Jesus would not be our substitute for sin, that he would not be resurrected. Since his hopes in this area have not been realised, his hopes are now centred on us, so that we will not inherit the reward Jesus has for us if we are faithful. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says, and if you like to look it up, it says, I know the plans I have for you, to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Jesus' greatest hope is that we will all come to repentance and that none should perish. So how is it with you? As you view the problems of the world this, these days, there is sickness, there is crime, there is pollution, there's disasters, there's food shortages in many countries, man's inhumanity to man, and the de general degradation of moral standards. What hope have we got except in the amazing sacrifice of Jesus and looking towards his second coming and hoping that our families and our friends are in the earth made new? So that is my prayer for you today, that we will look forward, that we will have a hope, because when we think about things, we can get very depressed, but when we think about Jesus and what he has done for us, we have a hope. And don't forget that we should always be ready to give, a, give a, an answer of the hope that is within us to anybody who should ask. Let us sing hymn number 522, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. <laughs> <laughs>